This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam, in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, inshallah, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register or for more info. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I apologize for the delay. Inshallah, we'll go ahead and get started. So continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as sirah to nabawiyah, the prophetic biography, in the last couple of sessions, we've been talking about the events leading up to the conquest of Mecca, Fathu Mecca. And we talked about exactly why the conquest of Mecca occurred, meaning the violation of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah by the Quraysh. And then we talked about the Prophet wasallam's departure from the city of Medina towards the direction of Mecca. What we're going to be talking about today is what occurs on the way to Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim army, as we talked about, 12,000 uh, people, they are marching in the direction of Mecca. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ, as mentioned by a number of different sources, uh, the books of Sirah like Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Kathir, and also the books of Hadith like Bukhari and Muslim, they mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ stopped at a place on the way from Medina to Mecca by the name of Marru Dhahran. Marru Dhahran, the Prophet ﷺ stopped there. And they stopped there and they set up camp for some time, that they were going to be spending some amount of time there. While they were stopped there, there's a few things that actually occur. Prior to even reaching the point of Marru Dhahran, the Prophet ﷺ was met by Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, along with Abbas's family. And Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, from what we are told, from what we know, from the narrations, he had already essentially accepted Islam, but he was keeping his Islam hidden, he was keeping his Islam private. And at this moment, he had made the very courageous and also uh, strategic decision to go ahead and publicly come out uh, with his Islam, to announce his Islam, and take his family and migrate to the city of Medina. So as they were appro- they were heading out from Mecca, going towards the city of Medina, moving there, that is when he met the Prophet ﷺ on his way to Mecca, which tells us one thing. And the one thing that it tells us is that the Prophet's plan about not very publicly announcing and not leaking the information to the Quraysh that the Prophet ﷺ is headed there and when and how and where you know he's exactly coming from, that information had not gotten out. So he runs into the Prophet ﷺ, he meets the Prophet ﷺ there. It's Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, along with his family, and there was one other individual, there were two other individuals, excuse me. The other individual was a cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. His name is Abu Sufyan. Now this is not the Abu Sufyan that we're going to be talking about in just a moment, inshallah. However, the Prophet ﷺ had a cousin also by the name of Abu Sufyan. He was obviously not as a prominent member of the Meccan community as Abu Sufyan, the one that had led the armies against the Prophet ﷺ in Uhud, in Khandaq, in the trench. Right? So this is another Abu Sufyan who is a first cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu, Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith ibn Abd al-Muttalib who was a first cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. He also was with them, and there was a third individual with them, his name is Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah al-Makhzumi. Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah. 
Now, why is he such a notable person? He is the brother of Ummu Salama. Ummu Salama, the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, this is her brother. They were also with Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The narration Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, actually they both mentioned that Abu Sufyan had, excuse me, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu had essentially accepted Islam, but he was keeping his Islam private, he was keeping it hidden. And the Prophet, and he was remaining in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ was fully aware of this and the Prophet ﷺ, wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anhu radin. The Prophet ﷺ was completely okay with this. He had approved of this arrangement. You keep your Islam hidden, remain safe, and remain in Mecca until further notice. So Abbas was fine. The Prophet ﷺ welcomed him and was very happy to see him and welcome him. As far as the other two individuals, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ and the brother in law of the Prophet. ﷺ, Abu Sufyan and Abdullah. Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, when they got there to the Muslim camp, they went straight to Umm Salama. Because they had a history with the Prophet sallallahu And the history was that they had both been very aggressive and negative and even insulting towards the Prophet sallallahu previously. So they knew that it's best for us to go through an intermediary, to be introduced to the Prophet ﷺ, to have somebody put in a good word for us. So they went to Ummu Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha. Ummu Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha went and spoke to the Prophet ﷺ. فَكَلَّمَتْهُ أُمُّ سَلَمَ تَفِيهِمَا فَقَالَتْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِبْنُ عَمِّكَ وَإِبْنُ عَمَّتِكَ وَصِهْرُكَ She went to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, O Messenger of God, your cousin is here to see you. And similarly, your brother-in-law is here to see you as well. The Prophet ﷺ responded initially by saying, لَا حَاجَةَ لِي بِهِمَا I don't need to speak to them. أَمَّا إِبْنُ عَمِّي فَهَتَكَ عِرْضِي My cousin, he insulted me and abandoned me when I needed him the most. He had been very negative towards the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. And had actually verbally assaulted and attacked the Prophet on numerous occasions. Wa amma ibn ammati, as for the other, your brother, فَهُوَ الَّذِي قَالَ لِي بِمَكَّةَ مَا قَالَ He's the one who said what he had said to me. And what had he said? Imam al-Suhayli in Aradul Al-Anf mentions that he had said to the Prophet ﷺ, وَاللَّهِ لَا آمَنْتُ بِكَ He says that, I swear to God, I will never believe in you. حَتَّى تَتَّخِذَ سُلَّمًا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ Until, number one, you are able to build a ladder going up into the heavens. فَتُعَرِّجُ فِيهِ وَأَنَا أَنْظُرُ And then you climb up to, into the heavens while I'm watching. ثُمَّ تَأْتِي بِسَكِّنْ وَأَرْبَعَةٍ مِّنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ يَشْهَدُونَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَرْسَلَكَ Then you come back with some proof and evidence and angels with you who will all testify to us and prove to us that you are in fact the messenger of God. And he had done this very publicly to just humiliate and insult the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ said that this is how he treated me. My cousin as well had multiple times verbally assaulted me and attacked me. I'm not interested in speaking to them. Abu Sufyan, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, the narration mentions that when he heard that the Prophet ﷺ is upset with him, he said that, وَاللَّهِ لَا يَأْذَنَنَّ لِي أَوْ لَا أَخُذَنَّ بِيَدِ بُنَيَّ هَذَا ثُمَّ لَنَذْهَبَنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ حَتَّى نَمُوتَ عَطْشًا وَجُوعًا He had his son with him, and he said that either my cousin Muhammad ﷺ agrees to see me, he forgives me, and sees me, talks to me, or I'll take my son and we'll go out and we'll you know, waste away somewhere in the earth, die of thirst and hunger, and just not have any place to go to. Like we have no choice. We're here at his mercy now. فَرَقَ ذَلِكَ فَرَقَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ The Prophet of course, he's compassionate, he's merciful, he's forgiving. And, and there's a very important point here. And in everything that occurs with the Prophet ﷺ, there's a profound example for us. The Prophet ﷺ had forgiven people who had done much, much more than this. And we'll see that the other Abu Sufyan, 
who had been involved in attacking and killing so many Muslims and believers, even family members of the Prophet ﷺ, he forgave him. The Prophet ﷺ of course was going to forgive them. There was no doubt about that. But what we see here is that what the Prophet ﷺ was particularly bothered by, was more so bothered by, was the fact that, fine, you verbally assaulted me, you attacked me, you ridiculed me, you mocked me, that's fine. But y'all were family. This cousin of his was somebody he had grown up with. He said, you were like a brother to me. You knew me my whole life, you knew better. This brother-in-law, you were a good close friend of mine. And so, y'all should have had my back. And for whatever reason, if you didn't understand, you should have at least had the decency to not you know, attack me and ridicule me. You should have had that decency. And so there was definitely pain and hurt on the part of the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a profound example in this, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That the Prophet ﷺ was a human being, was a man. The greatest human being to ever live, not to diminish the status of the Prophet ﷺ, but Allah sent a, the Messenger as a human being for us as an example. That there will be situations where you'll be hurt by the people closest to you. And it will hurt. Right? When we talk about forgiveness, when we talk about the capacity of the heart, we talk about the purification of the heart, and we talk about these things, a lot of times we talk about them in a very unrealistic manner and fashion. We talk about them as if purification of the heart or being a good believer means somehow being like a superhero, having like superpowers. Where you don't have any emotions, where nothing can ever hurt your feelings, where nothing can ever bother you. And that's not the case at all. What makes... What makes a believer so remarkable is that you will, when, when people closest to you betray you, it will hurt. It will profoundly hurt. But you will then have the capacity, you will work through the process. There's a process. Always learn the process, implement the process, respect the process. You will work through the process of forgiveness and overcoming that pain and that hurt and keeping something bigger in front of you. And that is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to earn the forgiveness of Allah, so you will practice forgiveness. You want the mercy of Allah, so you will practice mercy. You want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be merciful and, and kind with you. So you will practice compassion and empathy. And you will overcome that. And you will think about the life of the hereafter and negotiate the fact that some pain in the life of this world, not getting to taste the gratification of vengeance in this world. Not that vengeance is a good thing, but we're, we have, we have, we have an animalistic nature to us. We are very animalistic as well. We have animal tendencies. So the animal loves the taste of that fresh hot blood that kill. And so there's a there's a there's a there's a problematic part of us, the nafs, the lower self that wants to taste that blood. But you will sacrifice, you will give up tasting that blood for the life of the hereafter. For the eternal bliss of the life of the hereafter. It takes one good deed. Hadith al-Bitaqa. The authentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ tells us, a man will come with dafatir. A person will come with 99 records full of sins. And there will be one little slip, one little bitaqa, one little piece of paper that will have la ilaha illallah, a good deed written on it. And that will lead to the forgiveness of that person. It can take one good deed. And who knows that practicing forgiveness in a very difficult moment might not be, might be that good deed. That earns you the forgiveness and the mercy of Allah and takes you to paradise. So, this is a profound lesson from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, being our role model and our teacher, right? The Prophet ﷺ teaches us through his own example where he shares with us the fact that it did hurt. لَا حَاجَةَ لِي بِهِمَا I don't want to talk to them. My cousin, he hurt me. My brother-in-law, he insulted me. It's, it hurts. 
But then the Prophet ﷺ shows us, he demonstrates to us, he teaches us, practice mercy and forgiveness. And the Prophet ﷺ forgave them. And he said, please, tell them to come talk to me. And they came to see the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ greeted them, and honored them. And they both accepted Islam. They both became Muslim. As, as I was, I was mentioning, they proceeded on forward and they set up camp. The Prophet ﷺ told everyone to settle down at the place of Maru Dhahran. When they settled down there, the narration mentions that Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there, there's, there's a, there's a couple of little, uh, tidbits that I wanted to mention before I get to the main story about Abu Sufyan. Number one, when they were there at the place of Marwud Dahran, some of the Sahaba were very hungry. So they were looking for something to eat in the area. And there's a couple of things that are mentioned. Number one, it mentions that the, they went out to look for, you know, just some fruits on some trees or branches. And as they were looking for that, the Prophet ﷺ advised them. He said, عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْأَسْوَدِ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ أَطْيَبُ Eat the fruits that are darker in color because they're better, they're nicer, they're sweeter. And when the Sahaba heard that, they were very intrigued. Huh. Like how does the Prophet ﷺ have so much experience out in this region, kind of out in the desert? So... The thing is that that area in the desert, the people that used to spend a lot of time out there were shepherds. Because when they would take the animals to graze, they would take them out there. So some of the sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ, "Akunta tara al ghanam, Ya Rasulullah, did you used to shepherd animals? How would you be this, that familiar with this region? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, wa hal min nabiyyin illa wa qad ra'aha. He said, absolutely I was a shepherd. Every single Prophet served as a shepherd. Every single prophet served as a shepherd. Because it teaches you how to take care. How to take care of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ghazali and some other scholars have talked in a lot of detail about the specific details and the benefits and the nuances of shepherding. You know, animals, particularly goats and sheep, like this nature of an animal. An animal of that nature. Because number one, they are, they're very, they, they wander about. They're very mindless creatures, right? They're very mindless creatures. They're not like sharp animals like camels or horses. They're very mindless creatures. So they kind of wander about aimlessly a lot. So they keep on straying. You can never let your guard completely down. You can't just kind of like take them out there and just go to sleep and wake up and they're still kind of taking care of business. That's not the way they work. They'll start wandering about. You go to sleep and you wake up and half of them are gone. So you have to constantly watch them. Keeps you on your toes. Number two is that as much as they keep wandering, you, they go out, you bring them back in, they go out, you bring them back in, you, they go out, you bring them back in. What happens the third, the fourth, the fifth time? Parents particularly know about this. Right? What happens third, fourth, fifth time? You get frustrated. You get angry. But these animals, they're not, again, they're not like camels, they're not like big, huge animals. So you can't whip them hard. You'll hurt the animal. So you have to gently keep bringing them back. Gently keep bringing them back. And it teaches them, it, te- it instills the training within those prophets and messengers on how to handle human beings. Because Allah tells us in the Quran, if there's any creature that's more aimless, more mindless than even these goats and sheep, than cattle, it's the human being. If there's an animal that is even more sensitive and delicate than these creatures, it'll be the human being. If there's any creature that's more frustrating than these animals, it's the human being. And there's, uh, Imam Ghazali talks about this, that there's one particular characteristic of the human being that these animals don't possess. That can make them better than the human being, if the human being is not refined. If the human being is refined, لَقَدَ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ Then the human being is the best of all of God's creation. But if, it's, if the human being does not refine him or herself, there's one particular quality that these animals don't have. And that's that malice, that evil. The human being is very malicious. These creatures are not malicious. There's no ma- malice. There's no ill intent. That, that goat is not trying to like bother you. Is not trying to ruin your life. But a human being will try to ruin your life. So you have to learn that level of patience and gentleness. 
And this is a comment the Prophet ﷺ made at this time. A second very remarkable and beautiful, uh, you know, uh, n- narration or incident that occurred at this time is that to climb up onto some of the trees to check to see if the fruits were ripe or not, they needed somebody to climb up on the tree and check the fruits, and if it was, then pluck them and kind of toss them down. People would catch them in the sheets or in a basket or something. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a little bit lighter, and he was a little bit quicker. He climbed up the tree, and he was the one plucking kind of the fruits, checking the fruits and plucking them. While he was up there, he had kind of tied up his clothes. So he had to kind of lift up his pants and kind of tie up his clothes. So they looked at his legs, and Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu had really thin little legs. This is Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who is loved and adored and respected by us. So we don't use these types of names. You know, and in general, we don't, we shouldn't use these types of names. But just so everyone understand what I mean by when he had thin little legs, the, the, the types of comments people will tease them, call somebody like chicken legs or something like that. So he had these thin little legs. So some people started kind of, you know, just goofing around and just kind of joking around. Some people started to kind of point and started to laugh and make fun of. Like, oh, oh, look at his legs. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, was bothered by this. The Prophet ﷺ, he heard some people making these comments and laughing and pointing. The Prophet ﷺ said, تَعْجَبُونَ مِنْ دِقَّةِ سَاقِي You are so amused by how thin his legs are. فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَهُمَا أَثْقَلُ فِي الْمِيزَانِ مِنْ أُحُد He says, I swear by the one who holds his life in his hands, or, or I swear by the one who holds my life in his hands, like I swear by Allah, that the legs of Ibn Mas'ud, as thin as they may seem to you, are going to be more weighty in the scale of good deeds than the mountain of Uhud. Like the amount of good deeds that he's done, he's, he's performed with those skinny little legs that you point and laugh at is more than the mountain of Uhud. So you be careful. There's a very beautiful comment made by the Prophet ﷺ that again teaches us the obvious lesson about mocking and ridiculing and how these things are very, very unfortunate and tragic and these are things we shouldn't engage in. And on top of that, it tells you about the virtue of Abdullah bin Masood and how it tells us, again, shares with us an example in, in, in the Prophet ﷺ that when you come across a situation where somebody might be laughing or somebody might be picking on someone that's standing up for that person who is being made fun of. Standing up for that person that's being mocked is a very noble act and it's a part of your responsibility in that situation. So, moving on, when they were camped out there at the place of Marwa Dhahran, the Prophet ﷺ had, as I had mentioned before, they had very strategically and very beautifully executed this whole plan. And the people of Quraysh didn't have any information about when are they coming and how are they coming, they didn't have any information. And because, you know, Quraysh basically had violated the treaty, and they knew they were in trouble, there was a huge breakdown in kind of even the intelligence gathering of Quraysh. So they didn't have a lot of information. So what happened was, Abu Sufyan, the Abu Sufyan, the leader of Quraysh, Hakim bin Hizam, who was a cousin of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he was also a leader of the Quraysh. And a third leader of the Quraysh, whose name was Budail bin Warqa. These three leaders of the Quraysh, they themselves went out of Mecca to walk around, to go around and try to gather some information, to try to see if they could find somebody. They got not right at the encampment, but they got close to the camp. And they saw a lot of like fires lit in the distance, And they saw a huge number of people, 12,000 people, they saw a huge number of people. And they became very curious. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, who had already accepted Islam and was now with the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he tells the story himself, he says, Wa sabaha Quraysh. He said, I was very worried about Quraysh. That if Quraysh did not surrender to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, that if Quraysh did not you know, give in and accept the terms and kind of proactively surrender to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, I was afraid that if this became a fight, that the Quraysh would be annihilated. So I was worried about Quraysh, I wanted them to survive. So he says, I borrowed the donkey of the Prophet ﷺ. 
the donkey the Prophet ﷺ used to ride. I borrowed the donkey of the Prophet ﷺ, al-Bayda. It was a white colored donkey. And I went out on that donkey kind of riding out. And my and I said, you know, I'm going to go out and gather some firewood. And my, my thought process was that I'm going to walk around pretending to gather firewood. Hopefully there are maybe some spies or some scouts from the Quraysh who might be around. They'll see me, they'll realize the Muslim army is this close, and then they'll proactively take the measure of surrendering to the Prophet ﷺ. Because I did not want this to become a fight. I didn't want bloodshed. He says, while I was out and about, kind of walking around, I heard a couple of people talking from like over the hill. And I said, that, that, that voice sounds familiar. And it was Abu Sufyan. So I went there and I said, Abu Sufyan? He looked at me, he says, Abu Fadl? That was Abbas Iskunni, Abu Fadl. Abu Fadl? He says, yes, it's me. He says, yes, it's me, Abu Sufyan. He says, what's going on? Why are you here? And Abu Sufyan tells him that I've seen fires lit and I've seen a huge number of people unlike we've ever seen outside of Mecca. Something's up. And he tells him at that time, he says that this is the Prophet ﷺ. هذا رسول الله في الناس. This is the Prophet ﷺ with the Muslim army. وَيَا Quraysh. He says, I'm worried about y'all. Y'all better not turn this into a fight. It won't end well for y'all. Wallahi la in dafara bikala yadribana unukaka. If you end up fighting them, they will defeat you. And then you'll pay the price. So he says, What should I do? The Abbas says, I have a plan. If you if you trust me, I have a plan. He says, sit on the donkey with me. This is the donkey of the Prophet. ﷺ. Sit on the donkey with me, kind of pull you know the hood over your head. So nobody recognizes you. It's the donkey of the Prophet I'm the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Nobody will be suspicious. Just get on the donkey and just come with me. So he says, okay. So now he gets back to the Muslim camp. They start walking through the Muslim camp. And again, it's the donkey of the Prophet ﷺ being ridden by the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. There's another man behind him, but everyone says, okay, nothing to worry about, nothing to look at here. Everyone keeps minding their business. As they keep on proceeding until they pass... Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. A few other people notice Abbas and they greet him and he greets them back and they keep walking. Finally, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu sees him, he greets him and he gets up and he comes close and he looks and goes, oh, it's Abu Sufyan. It's Abu Sufyan. He grabs Abu Sufyan by the neck and he takes him, drags him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu says, I ran in after him and I ran in after him and he takes Abu Sufyan to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, O oh, Messenger of God, Hada Abu Sufyan, this is Abu Sufyan, and look, God presented him to us, we should make an example out of him, we should start with him. These people are traitors, these people violated the treaty, these people are treacherous, let's make an example out of him, let's start with him. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala who runs in and he says, O oh, Messenger of God, O oh, Messenger of God, I take him under my protection. And the Prophet ﷺ had said in a narration that even the, the, the most common person in the Muslim community, when they grant their protection and their word to somebody, that is, prote- that is, re- that is respected by the entire community. So Abbas says, I have taken him under my protection. And there's a little conversation that happens that's very interesting here. I want everyone to pay attention to this. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Umar radiallahu anhu keeps arguing, keeps saying, no messenger of Allah, we should make an example out of him. And Abbas says, I got frustrated, and I said that, mahlan ya Umar, calm down Umar, what are you doing? And Abbas says to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that if this was somebody from your family, if this was somebody from your family, you wouldn't have been doing this. You'd be eager on how to bring this person into Islam. You wouldn't be here trying to make an example out of this person. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Mahlan ya Abbas. He says, calm down. Don't accuse me of that. And he says something so beautiful. He says, فَوَاللَّهِ لَا إِسْلَامُكَ يَوْمَ أَسْلَمْتَ كَانَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ إِسْلَامِ الْخَطَّابِ لَوْ أَسْلَمْ He says, the day that you, O Abbas, O uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, the day you became Muslim, 
was a happier day for me than even if my father would have become Muslim. Why? وَمَا بِي إِلَّا Why is that? إِنِّي قَدْ عَرَفْتُ أَنَّ إِسْلَامَكَ كَانَ أَحَبَّ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم مِنْ إِسْلَابِ الْخِطَّابِ لَوْ أَسْلَمَ Because I knew that you becoming Muslim would make the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم happier than my own father becoming Muslim. And the happiness of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم comes before our own happiness. Don't, 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 don't accuse me that I would be invested into my own family. I only say this because I, 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 I believe in what I'm saying. This is my honest opinion. The Prophet ﷺ interjects at this moment and he says, اِذْهَبْ بِهِ يَا عَبْنَ عَبَّاسْ إِلَىٰ رَحْلِكَ The Prophet ﷺ says, take him. It was late at night. The Prophet ﷺ tells Abbas, take him to your tent. Get some rest. I will speak to him in the morning when everyone's fresh, when everyone's cooled off. Because it was a really... I mean, even Abu Sufyan was rattled. Umar was grabbing him by the neck, talking about executing him. Right? So he was rattled. So he said, everybody calm down, relax, we'll talk in the morning. In the morning when they get together, the Prophet ﷺ says, وَيْحَكْ يَا أَبَا Sufyan." He says, listen, O Abu Sufyan. Look at, look at what, everything that you've done up till this point. أَلَمْ يَعْنِي لَكَ أَنْ تَعْلَمَ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ he says, hasn't the time come that you now finally acknowledge that there's no one worthy of worship except for Allah? Abu Sufyan says, Bi Abi anta wa ummi, ma ahlamaka wa akramaka wa awsalaka. He says, I would sacrifice anything for you. You are so patient, and so noble, so honorable, and so forgiving. They give me this opportunity. Now who gives their enemy this type of an opportunity? And he says, "Wallahi laqad darantu anna law kana ma Allahi ghayruhu laqad aghna anni shay'an ba'du." He says, "I've known this for quite some time. That there's no one but Allah who can save me. I've known this for quite some time." He says, "Way hakya Abu Sufyan." He goes, "Okay, now listen, pay attention. Alam yani laka an ta'lam anni Rasulullah." Hasn't the time come that you finally acknowledge that I'm the messenger of God? Again, he says, "Bi abi anta wa ummi, I would sacrifice anything for you. Ma ahlamaka wa akramaka wa awsalaka, you are very noble and forgiving and gentle and kind." Amma hadhi wallahi fa inna fi nafsi minha hatta al-ana shay'an. He says, "If I'm being honest with you." I still have some reservations and hesitations about this fact. About just acknowledging that you are the Messenger of Allah. Abbas, who is old friends with Abu Sufyan, and he's vouched for Abu Sufyan, he says, Wayhak. He says, what is wrong with you? Aslim washhad. Accept Islam, just give in, just put your ego aside for a moment. You have no idea of the nobility of this man. A man whom God calls noble. Like put your ego aside. And so finally Abu Sufyan says, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And he finally accepts Islam. And at that time the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Sufyan then pleads with the Prophet ﷺ, please, I am here as a representative, as a leader of my people, grant them amnesty. Grant them protection, safety. The Prophet wasallam, beautiful, beautiful narration. The Prophet wasallam, he says to Abu Sufyan, مَنْ دَخَلَ فِي دَارِي أَبُو Sufyan, That anyone who enters into the home of Abu Sufyan, فَهُوَ آمِنٌ He shall be protected. Anyone who enters into the home of Abu Sufyan, as we enter Mecca, will be granted protection, will be safe. Abu Sufyan says, وَمَا تَسَعُ دَارِي My home is not that big. I'm trying to save everybody. The Prophet ﷺ, look how noble. The Prophet ﷺ, think about how, how somebody who has the upper hand would react in this situation. What, you have demands? Well, who put you in a position to negotiate? But what does the Prophet ﷺ say? He says, مَنْ دَخَلَ الْكَعْبَةَ فَهُوَ آمِنٌ Somebody who enters into the Kaaba will be granted protection, will be safe. He says, وَمَا تَسَعُ الْكَعْبَ The Kaaba is not even big enough. The Prophet says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَ الْمَسْجِدَ فَهُوَ آمِنٌ Whoever enters into the masjid, the area around the Kaaba itself, where we do the tawaf, the masjid. Whoever enters into the masjid shall be safe. 
The masjid obviously was not as big as it is today. So he says, وَمَا يَسَعُ masjid. Even the masjid won't suffice everybody. Then finally the Prophet ﷺ says, وَمَنْ أَغْلَقَ عَلَيْهِ بَابَهُ فَوَآمِنُونَ Anyone who goes into their own home and closes the door, we will take that as a sign that they are surrendering and nobody will harm them, nobody will lay a finger on them. And Abu Sufyan finally says, هَذِهِ وَاسِعَاد Okay, that'll work for everybody. And then finally Abu Sufyan, he departs. And before he departs, I wanted to mention, he talks about some of his observations, some of the things that he saw while he was there in the company of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ tells Abbas, that take Abu Sufyan to this spot and let him watch all the different tribes and groups of people that are in the army kind of passing by. Give him some perspective about how far this message has gone. And Abu Sufyan says that every time, كُلَّمَا مَرَّتْ قَبِيلَةٌ Every time a group from the army, a tribe in the army would pass, he would ask Abbas, Ya Abbas man ha'ula, who are these people? He would say, Sulaym. He would say, Mali wali Sulaym. Like, what do we even have to do with the people of Sulaym? Like, how did the people of Sulaym end up in this situation? Then another tribe would go by, he'd say, who are these people? He'd say, Muzayna. These are the people of Muzayna. He would say, Mali wali Muzayna. How did the people of Muzayna get involved with this? Every single time a tribe would come by, he would say, who are these people? And he would say, this is so it's such and such tribe. He'd be like, how did that tribe come into this? He was astounded by how far and wide and how universal the message of the Prophet ﷺ was. And there was a little incident that occurred here, you know, that is very interesting. Sa'ad bin Ubadah, the group of the Ansar passed by and he says, Man ha'ula? He says, ha'ula il Ansar. These are the people of the Ansar, the people of Medina. Sa'ad bin Ubadah, one of the leaders of the Ansar, obviously you have to understand that it's it's a difficult situation. They knew who Abu Sufyan was. He had led an army against Medina, so it takes time. Sa'ad bin Ubadah, when he sees Abu Sufyan, he says, Ya Abu Sufyan! Hey, listen Abu Sufyan. al yawm yawmul malhama. Today is a day of war. Today will be a day of killing. al yawm tustahallul hurma. Today even the sacred will be violated. Kind of, you know, if, to use a different word, it's kind of like, you know, it's, 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 like what the, what the kids call trash talking. Right? It's kind of rubbing it in a little bit. So he says this, and Abu Sufyan is a little bothered by it. He says, look, I accepted Islam. The Prophet ﷺ granted us protection. And for you to talk like this, like today we're going to kill people and all this, it's not, I don't think it's appropriate. And he was bothered by it. He went to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Sa'ad said such and such. And Sa'ad bin Ubadah was the one carrying the banner, the flag of the Ansar. And he says, Sa'ad said such and such. The Prophet ﷺ called Sa'ad bin Ubadah, and he says that that was wrong of you to do. That was wrong. And he says, بَلْ هَذَا يَوْمٌ يُعَذِّمُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ الْكَعْبَةِ Today is the day that God will restore the honor of the Kaaba. وَيَوْمٌ تُكْسَى فِيهِ الْكَعْبَةِ Today is the day that we will once again place the cover on the Kaaba. Today is not a day of killing and disrespect. Today, today is a day of nobility and honor. And he told Sa'ad, give the flag over to somebody else. The Prophet ﷺ reprimanded. Holding his own people accountable. Because the, one, the, 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 power, the lesson the Prophet ﷺ taught us, it doesn't matter if you're, if, you have, if, if you're losing or you're winning, it doesn't matter whether you have the, your, your, you have the upper hand, or you are suffering defeat. Doesn't matter whether you're enjoying victory or suffering defeat. All we have is our character, our nobility, our dignity, our honor. And we never sacrifice that. We never compromise that. Now, at this particular time, um, Abu Sufyan also, excuse me, Abu Sufyan also sees, you know, um, the, he, he notes that he watched the people, when the time for prayer came, the adhan was called and people went to go make the prayer. He says that, you know, he sees the Prophet ﷺ making wudu and people are catching the water as it drips from the hands and the face of the Prophet ﷺ into their own hands. And they rub it on their own faces and their own hands. 
And then when the adhan is called, and the Prophet ﷺ goes to stand, everyone lines up exactly straight to pray. And he asks, Abbas, Ya Abbas, ma ya'muruhum bi shayin illa fa'aluhu? He says, they do whatever he tells them to do. He said, Naam, wallahi law amarahum bi tarkit ta'ami wa sharabi la ata'uhu. He said, absolutely, I swear to God, if he told them not to eat or drink anymore, they would obey him. That's the type of obedience they have to the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Sufyan, he commented, he said, Ya Abbas, ma ra'aytuka layla wa la mulka kisra wa qaysar. What I have seen from the believers, what I have seen with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have not seen in the kingdoms of Persia and Rome. The emperors of Rome and Persia don't have such devotion from their followers. And he in fact, he tells Abbas, he said, لَقَدْ أَصْبَحَ مُلْكُ إِبْنِ أَخِيكَ الْغَدَاتَ عَظِيمًا He said, your nephew has a great kingdom. Your nephew has a great kingdom, has great power. He says, I told him, Ya Abba Sufyan, innaha nubuwa, it is not kingdom, it is not power, it is prophethood. It is prophethood. He said, na'am fa'idhan, he said, that's why. That's why. Because I haven't seen devotion like this, even with kings. This is a different level of devotion. This is not kingdom. This is not kingship. This is prophethood. Abu Sufyan goes back now to Makkah ahead of the Muslim army with the permission of the Prophet ﷺ. When he goes back, he takes back the news that the Prophet ﷺ has granted us protection. Everybody go into your homes, everyone enter into your homes and you will be safe. The narration mentions that his own wife, Hind bint Utbah, who we'll be talking about later, she would also accept Islam. But his own wife, Hind bint Utbah, she grabs Abu Sufyan and tells the people around her that grab him and kill him, for he has surrendered to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has accepted defeat from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She's infuriated. And Abu Sufyan gets up and he pleads with the people. He says that, no, I, what I have done is I have saved your lives. I have gotten you protection from the Prophet ﷺ. Now go into your homes and close your doors and you will be safe. And it's the people of Makkah basically all retreated within their homes. They closed the doors and they braced themselves for the arrival of the Muslim army into Makkah. And we'll go ahead and stop and pause here insha'Allah. And next session what we'll talk about is the actual entering of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim army into Makkah and exactly what happened and what transpired at that particular time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakhfiraka wa natubu ilayk. Mm-hmm.